Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldman. Okay, once again, program number three this afternoon. And uh, again, we'd like to welcome our television audience from wherever you are. And uh, always like to make it plain, we're just a simple Bible study. I don't claim to be a deep theologian, but if the Lord has given me anything, it's the ability to make things simple and easily understood. And uh, that's all we hope to do. We don't want to try to show our knowledge of Greek and all this stuff, we're just going to simply teach the book, and uh, well, once in a while I'll, I'll go look at a Greek dictionary, but I really don't spend a lot of time trying to uh, drum up new ideas by just simply uh, studying the Greek, I think, which a lot of them are trying to do today. But anyhow, we're just going to take the Word of God for what it says and let the chips fall where they may, as we've said before. Uh, I'm not underwritten by anybody, so that's why we have to thank every one of you out there for your gifts, whether they're one dollar or more. We thank God for every dollar of it, and uh, as our ministry grows, as Gary knows only too well, our bill goes with it, but the Lord always supplies. We always stay just one step ahead of our bills, so uh, I think we can honestly say we've never been behind, but we sure don't have a lot of money in the bank. But uh, I think that's the way the Lord would have it. All right, now let's go back to 1 John, chapter 5. And uh, I'm thinking I'm going to stick my neck way out. I'll probably get it lopped off. But uh, I've looked at several commentaries, and not a one of them are going to approach this the way I'm going to. So maybe I'm way out in left field. If there's some Bible scholar out there, don't tear your hair. Uh, I'm not going to say that... This is the only way to look at it, but uh, hopefully we can get something out of it. All right, this is the last part of Book 57. Uh, that's my wife's bag, you know. She takes care of all these materials and everything, and uh, she likes to make folks understand where we are. So she's going to be happy now that I announce it's Book 57. We're in the last four programs. All right, First John, Chapter 5, and... Uh, Verse 6, this is he, speaking of Jesus of Nazareth, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that beareth witness because the Holy Spirit is truth. Now, in these next two programs, over these next couple of verses, or three, I'm going to try and answer the question that comes in so often to the ministry. Was Jesus Christ God? That's one. And the other one is, can you show me scriptures about a triune God? Or they'll usually use the word Trinity. Can you show me the proof of the Trinity. Well, of course, the first thing I have to answer is the Trinity is as a word not used in our Bible. You can't find Trinity in your Bible. So it's a coin term. But we usually refer to the Godhead as a Trinity because it is a three person in one Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. A triune Godhead, which theologians have coined the term the Trinity, which is all well and good. Nothing wrong with that. All right, so we're going to try and, over these next two programs, I may just sort of run the two together, show scripturally how that they are three distinct persons, personalities, and yet they operate as one God. But first we're going to look at what does this mean, the blood and water. Now the first time that you see those two used in that, in that vein would be back in John's Gospel again. Chapter 3, where Jesus is dealing with Nicodemus. You all know the story of Nicodemus, ever since you were a little kid in Sunday school. All right, let's go right back to verse 1, honey. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 1. 
And of course, this is during his earthly ministry. He is ministering to the nation of Israel. No idea whatsoever about the Gentiles yet. Now verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. See how Jewish this is? The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Well, he had that right, didn't he? Then Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, that's plain, isn't it? In other words, Jesus has already determined that there would be no unbelievers going into the millennial reign. Now, back in the Old Testament, that concept wasn't known. The whole idea back in the Old Testament was that, well, let me just go back and show you what I mean. Honey, take, go back to Zechariah. Go back to your next to last book in the Old Testament, because I think a lot of times when I make mention of the fact that the prospect of Israel in the Old Testament was still that they could go into the kingdom as God's covenant people, and in turn then be the evangelists to bring salvation to the Gentiles, which would mean that they're in the kingdom as lost people. Have to be. But Israel is going to bring them salvation. Now that all ended, of course, when Israel rejected the Messiah the first time, and Jesus foresaw that, and so now he could make the plain that only believers will go into the kingdom, whether they're Jews or whether they are the remaining remnant of Gentiles, there will be no lost people going into the kingdom. But back here in the Old Testament, that's not the case. Zechariah, chapter 8, yeah, Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 20. And again, the language is so plain. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to have four seminary degrees to understand this. You just read it for what it says. All right, this is prophecy. This is Zechariah. And he's speaking of things to come. Verse 20, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. What does that mean? This is the word of God, speaking through the prophet. But it shall come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another city, and they'll say, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations, that is of the Gentile world, strong nations, and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days, when the kingdom is set up, and he's ruling from Jerusalem. In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold on of all the languages of the nations, take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, to me, that doesn't sound like believing Gentiles. They're seeking, but they know that these Jews have the answer. And so they're going to respond to Israel's presenting them to their Messiah. But Israel lost it. Israel dropped the ball when they rejected the Messiah and the king and the kingdom. And they will never have this opportunity. Now, I think the 144,000 will pick it up during the tribulation and yet fulfill a lot of this. But the nation as a whole... They've missed it. And so now, coming back to John 3, now you see John, uh, Jesus can speak here in John 3 that there will be no unbelievers going into the kingdom. He knew that. And so he lays it on Nicodemus that unless he has experienced a salvation that would bring him in to a born-again relationship with God, no one can see the kingdom of God. Now, you see... 
even though this is the first time this kind of language is brought to pass in Scripture, these Old Testament saints had a salvation experience. Not like we do in, in the same way, but they still had to come out of darkness and into the light. They still had to experience a salvation by faith. But, of course, there's still a lot of questions in the Old Testament salvation makeup. I'll never forget years ago. The lady has now gone on to be with the Lord, but her husband had been a brilliant Jewish Bible teacher. But this Jewish teacher's widow now was in one of my classes here in Oklahoma. And one night we were talking about the salvation of the Jew in the Old Testament. Jerry, you may remember. And my final answer to the class was, you know, I just can't put my thumb on it. And I've never found anybody that can. Maybe somebody out there thinks they can, but I'll, I'll, I'll refuse to believe it. It is just so hard to just nail all these things down. It's not cut and dried like it is for us today. But whatever, they had to have some kind of a salvation experience. So anyway, as the dear lady was leaving that night, I asked her, I said, what did your husband say about this? And she said, Les, you're not going to believe this. Almost word for word what you said tonight, that you cannot put your thumb on it. You, you just can't identify how they came into a salvation and how they, whether they kept it or whether they lost it. We don't know. But let me give you an example that the Old Testament believers experienced a salvation much as we do. Go back to Isaiah. We've used it in other lessons. Isaiah 61 Isaiah 61, and this is the prophet writing in his own experience. This is his testimony. Isaiah 61, verse 10. Now, don't forget why I'm leaving John to come back here. I want you to see that the Old Testament Jew had a knowledge of a salvation. See, I, I may be wrong, but I think a lot of the Jewish people think that by virtue of the fact that they're a member of the Jewish race, they are under the Jewish covenants, that every Jew is automatically saved. Well, I just can't quite see that from the Old Testament account. But be that as it may, here is Isaiah's testimony. Chapter 61, verse 10. And he writes, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For, because, this is why, because he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. Isaiah knew that he had salvation. He was a saved man. And salvation and saved are synonymous. Thou hast clothed me with the garments of salvation, he, that is God, has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. That's Isaiah's testimony. He too had experienced a salvation. He had literally been born again. But you don't see the term in the Old Testament, see? All right, so now if you'll come back to John's Gospel, chapter 3, this was not a whole new concept for Jews' necessity to be saved, but it's a new terminology. You don't see born again, at least that I'm aware of, anywhere in the Old Testament. And as I spoke here a few weeks ago, you don't see Paul use the word. You know that? Paul never uses the term born again. Now, he certainly refers to a new experience. He certainly experiences or he teaches us to experience a change of lifestyle from darkness to light. And he speaks of being born from above in Romans 8, 13. Yeah, chapter 8. But he never uses the term born again. Don't ask me why. Uh, I don't know. But there must be a little bit of a difference in the modus operandi that God is using. But whatever. Back here in John chapter 3 now. G see the kingdom of God. In other words, there's no eternal life. Now verse 4. This is a tough 
statement for old Nicodemus. Now, just to show you the ignorance of even a well-educated Jew like Nicodemus. But you know what? He wasn't any worse than most church people today. You talk about these things that I'm talking about this afternoon to the average church congregation, it goes right over their head. Am I right? Sure, you've all experienced it. They don't know what we're talking about. Well, it's not because they're lacking brain cells. They're just as smart as I am. But they've never taken the time to search the scriptures. They just of no count. All right, Nicodemus is no different. Now look at his response. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Stupid question, wasn't it? For an educated man? You mean I've got to go back into the mother's womb and be born a second time? Ridiculous. But he was serious. Now look at Jesus' answer. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born. Now here come the same words that John used. That's why I come up here now. Don't lose me. First John says, of the water and of the spirit. All right. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, what's, what's Jesus saying? Well, now, a lot of people, I suppose 90-some percent of Christendom, say, well, that's baptism. No, that's not baptism. All you mothers know that the birth of your child was what kind of a birth? Water. A cow man. I can tell you that preceding the birth of every calf, there comes the bursted water. All right, so you take from this verse then that unless you become a member of the human race, you have to be born into the human race in order to be eligible for all this. Because, see, God's not dealing with angels on this basis. He's dealing with humans. Are you with me? All right. So unless you're born into the human race, unless you have experienced a physical water birth from a human mother and then be born of the spirit, salvation birth, you can't enter heaven. Now think about that for a minute. Logic. First and foremost, you've got to become a what? A human being. As soon as you become a human being, you are in line for an opportunity for eternal life in the presence of God. But you'll never get there until the Holy Spirit does a work of convicting and opening your understanding and bringing you to the place to believe it, and now you become a child of God. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Born into the human race in a water birth, a physical birth, and then born into the family of God by a work of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you got both of those together, hey, you've got it made for all eternity. Pretty good deal, isn't it? For all eternity. And that we can't comprehend. I just can't comprehend it. All right. How does this deal with 1 John? Now, let's come back here again. Now, like I say, here's where I'm sticking my neck out, and I may have theologians just pulling their hair because I could not find a commentary that even addressed it. And I suppose this is why. They're, they're afraid to commit themselves. But here now in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, this is he, Jesus of Nazareth. This is he who came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and then the Spirit beareth witness. Okay, what are we talking about? Well, the same scenario. Before Jesus of Nazareth could become the God-man, or maybe we should put it the other way around, 
before he could become the man God, what did he have to become? Man. He became flesh. That's what the scripture says. He became flesh. But he never stopped being God. Not even in the womb. He never lost his deity. Now he lay, laid aside the glory of it. And the three disciples got a glimpse of that on the Mount of Transfiguration. But he never stopped being deity. So when he was born of Mary, a water birth, he became what? Flesh. But on the other hand, when he was born of the Spirit or of the blood, which, remember, originated with the Father, now he becomes deity. And what do we got? The God-man. That's the way I look at it. And all of Scripture is pointing this out, that the God of glory, the God of creation, would one day take on human flesh, be born of the virgin. And why is the virgin birth so fundamental to our faith? Because a human father could never have given rise to the divine, sinless blood of Christ. That blood had to originate with God the Father. And we know it did. See, and that's why I blow people out of the saddle when I tell them the mother's blood never commingles with the baby's. Never. That would have taken away his divine purity. But Christ's blood originated with the inception from the Father by way of the Holy Spirit. And so he's totally God by virtue of his blood, which is from the Father, but he's man by virtue of his birth from a human woman. Beautiful. And it all fits. And so... Again, I have to answer the question that comes quite often. Why, when Jesus on earth, when he would pray, would he pray to the Father? If he was the Father. Well, you see, my answer was, you've got to remember that when Jesus prayed from his humanity, he would pray to the Father. Now, when he was deity, he didn't have to pray to the Father. He didn't ask God to give him power to steal the Sea of Galilee. Did he? No. He just simply stepped up on deck and spoke to the wind, and in his deity, everything happened. But on the other hand, when he was in his humanity and he was sweating uh, drops of blood, now from his humanity point, who does he cry out to? The Father. Now, is that so hard to understand? Now, I know it takes a lot of faith. These things have to be taken by faith. That's what the Word of God says. All right, so here we have this... This God-man, born of the human way. Now, I guess, like I say so many times in my class in Oklahoma, a verse is banging me on the side of the head. I guess I'll go better go back and use it. Galatians. Galatians. Chapter 4. There must be some reason I'm supposed to use this verse. That's all I can say, because it just, I didn't intend to. But here it is. Galatians, chapter 4, verse 4. Oh, what a beautiful verse. You all got it? Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God, not Joseph and Mary, God sent forth his Son, but what? Made of a woman, so that he could become human. Made under the law. He came to the nation of Israel, and he lived under the law. He ministered under the law. But now, not just as the human man born of Mary, he's also the God person who would be in a role of the king of Israel. Now I think maybe I can come back all the way to Matthew. I think I've got time. Matthew chapter 1, and we've done this once or twice over the years, but it bears repeating as well. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. A genealogy. And of such a pertinent makeup 
that this is where the scoffers of Scripture show their ignorance. They don't catch this, evidently. How miraculously the genealogies of Christ are put together. The first one here in Matthew, of course, is the genealogy on Joseph's side of the family tree. And we'll look at briefly at Luke chapter 3, which is the genealogy on Mary's side of the tree. Because there are two family lines that come down from David. All right, let's look at the first one. Just, just skim through it. Verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And that's as far as it goes, or that's where it begins, however you want to put it. At 2000 B.C., halfway between Adam and Christ, comes Abraham. And this is where the genealogy now of Christ the King, Christ the Son of God, this is where it begins. It doesn't start with Adam. It starts with Abraham. Okay, now you'll see when you come through here, this is the side of the family tree that includes Solomon. Verse 6. And Jesse begat David the king. Now those of you who have been with me ever so long, back in 2 Samuel 7, what does God promise David? That through David would come a royal house like you've got in Europe tonight, the House of Hapburg, the House of Orange, the House of Windsor, and so forth. All right, David would be the beginning then of the royal family bloodline, the House of David. That's the blood side, because that's the side that determines his royal kingship. Now, I told you I'd run these two programs together, and it looks like I'm going to have to. Now, in Mary's genealogy, which we're going to pick up right away in the next program then, you've got to turn to Luke chapter 3. We haven't got time now in this program. It's down to seconds. But we'll open our next program with the other genealogy of Mary, and it will go all the way back to Adam. See? What a difference. What a difference. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.